Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, to get started, I need a guy volunteer from the audience. Let's see, uh, right, and the second row. There, there, there we go. Come on down, give him a hand. Come on up here. Come on up. Come on up there. Hey, I think I know who you are. Chris, everyone say hi, Chris. Now, 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 Chris, now, now, Chris, you, you, uh, you know what the, uh, you know what the talk is about today, right? You know the, okay, so, well, no, you know what the talk is about, right? It's, uh, right, it's about chastity. Yeah, yeah, chastity. It's about girls, dating, stuff like that. So, uh, so, uh, we got to cover certain issues. After issues, like, like, how far can you go, it's too far to go with a girl on a date, you know, and stuff like that. So, uh, so what Chris and I are going to do here. Chris and I, he and I are actually going to show you guys how far is too far to go on a date, all right? And uh, in order to do this, I'm going to be the guy, Chris is going to be the girl, okay? Now, now Chris, Chris is not a very pretty girl, uh, but that's a good thing, but we can, uh, we'll change that, we'll get you prettied up a little bit, so let's see, we'll, uh, we'll start with this, why don't, you, uh, why don't you put that on, there you go, yeah, you'll be pretty, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Look at that. Woo! That's uh, Lady Gaga. Uh, now, I've never, uh, I've never dated a Chris before, so we got to give you a name change. You could, you could girl's name. Let's see. You could be Clarice. Okay, is that a good name? We give it that a lot of work. So now, now, Clarice and I, we decide to go for a date, right? So we go for a date to the Grand Canyon. So let's say this is the Grand Canyon. I start thinking now. How far do you think I can get my beloved Clarice here to the edge of the Grand Canyon without actually throwing him off the Grand Canyon? And him, her, it, whatever. Uh, but there's a, only one way to find out how far we can go, so I've got to pick you up into my arms, all right? Okay, so hold on to this. We left hand, you hold on to me. <laughs> now, let's see, now, how far can we go to the edge? Let's find out, let's see. Uh, can, can we go further? Can we go further? No. no, no. He says no. Should I drop him? Okay, no, won't drop you. Take a seat. Give him a hand. Good job, Chris. Thank you very much. You're all done. Thank you, bud. Good man. Now, what's good sport? Now, what's what's the point of that whole deal? The point of that is basically this: none of us guys would take the girl we like to a dangerous place and think, well, how close can I get to killing her? You know, usually we don't ask. But when I was in high school, college, this is the question we had about girls. How far can you go with a girl? Can we do this with her? Can we do that with her? And at school, we'd have to hear these sex talks where someone would get up there and they'd be like, sex is bad, sex is dirty, you're gonna die. And it was always about guilt and fear. All they tried to do is scare us. And you know that approach, it doesn't work. So I remember left there to think, so what? All God cares about my love life is making sure I don't go too far with girls. But to prove to you that God's got a plan for your life, I was in Boston, Massachusetts. I met a boy named Kevin. He fell in love with a girl. They decided to get married. They go to church to get ready for the wedding. The priest is going through their paperwork. He's like, hey, look at that. You guys got baptized in the same church when you were babies. Oh, hey, that's cool. We didn't know that. He looks closer. Yeah, you guys got baptized on the same day in the same church as babies. They went to their parents' photo album, sure enough found a picture of the two babies getting baptized together years before they'd ever meet. So you never know what God's up to, man. You might be sitting right next to your future spouse right now, huh? Well, yeah, not, not, not everybody, yeah. Uh, one, one spouse per person. Now, I didn't think, though, I didn't think God had this big plan for my love life. So the relationships I got in high school tended to be very physical very fast. I remember in high school, I hooked up with this one girl, and we came to the point, and I had to ask myself, okay, should I give this girl my virginity? And I thought, well, I've known her. I've already known her for three days. And I could hear this voice in me that said, Jason, this gift is not for her. It's for me. Please wait for me. And we cooled things down. I was able to hold on to my virginity. I know some of you are virgins, some of you are not virgins. Frankly, I don't care what's happened in the past. And I care. Uh, for those of you who are virgins, I say good for you. I have right here what's considered in America to be the most comprehensive sex research ever done, 700 pages. Now what they found on page 503 is that people who get married as virgins have a divorce rate about 70% lower than those who won't wait for marriage. Now some people think, well that's great, but look, I'm not a virgin, 
or I had my virginity taken from me. Does that mean I'll have a messed up marriage? If you're like me, you're sick of all broken marriages, and I know divorce is different from America than here. I, would, I remember being at a high school once in America, a boy came up, he said, Jason, he goes, I know what you mean about divorce. He said, Jason, my dad's on his ninth marriage. This boy was 16, he saw his dad get divorced eight times. I live in San Diego, up the coast in Los Angeles. They have jewelry stores in LA where you can now rent wedding rings. That's how bad it is. The world expects our marriages will fail. And even if a divorce isn't legal, that doesn't mean that every marriage is peaceful and full of love. How do we find one that is? What I'm gonna recommend today is one simple idea. If you do wanna get married one day, are you willing to love your spouse before you meet the person? And what I mean is this, biggest question we always get is how far can you go? Can you do this with a girl, can you do that with a guy? Easy way to know where to draw the line. We were at a high school in Chicago, all boys high school, 800 boys. After the talk, guy raised his hand. He goes, okay, Jason, he goes, your talk was fun, but uh, can we get specific? I go, sure. He goes, I wanna know exactly how far I can go with my girlfriend. I said, that's a fair question, what do you wanna do with her? And he was like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great. And I go, well, we're not third grade, mature, specific. What do you want to do? And he's like, really? He's like, can we do this and this? And he went through all these sexual things. And I said, look, that's charming. Slow down. Pick one. And he's like, mm, okay, this. And he said something. It wasn't technically sex, but close. And I said, look, I'm going to have you answer your own question. Do you want to get married one day? He goes, yeah, I'll get married. So I said, okay, if you're going to get married, that means your future wife She's out there somewhere right now, isn't she? For the first time in his life, he thought about his future bride. And he said, yeah, she is out there, cool. And I go, but let's say she doesn't live here in Chicago. Let's say she lives where I live, in California. School's getting out right now. She's coming home from class with her boyfriend, who's a guy you're never gonna meet. And he's got his arm around your future wife. And he's saying, mm -mm, baby girl. <laughs> I love you so much. Your eyes are so beautiful. You're amazing just the way you are. And she's like, oh, you're so sweet. You know, and he walks her home and he sits her on his couch and he's like, hey, baby girl, are you feeling fine? Because you looking fine. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> stop, stop. And I said to this guy, I was like, man, you know what's going on on that couch, don't you? He's like, yeah. I said, that guy, I said, that guy is trying to trick your future wife into doing that sexual thing with him, trying to make her think that if she gives him that, oh, well, he'll like her more. When he's just using her more, I go, does that bug you? He was like, ew, uh, no. I go, really? That guy doing that with the girl you're gonna marry doesn't bother you. He was like, well, the guy next to him in class was like, oh, I'd be ticked off, and he smacked him in the head, and I broke him up, and I said, look, if you don't want somebody else doing it with the person you're gonna marry one day, set the same standards for yourself. And this is not a condemnation of any of us. It's a calling to real love. I'm not gonna stand in front of the guys in here and say you guys have to be like me. Because we're the same. Every guy in here has a desire to lust, but then a desire to love. There's a tension going on. What I want you girls to realize is the guys you're sitting next to in here, all of us have been lied to about what it means to be a man. We've been told, oh, if you wanna be a man today, you gotta to have sex with the girls. If you have sex with the girls, then you become a man. But what ends up happening is we hear this again and again. It's on TV. I'm watching a basketball game. I saw this car commercial on it. This lady is sitting in her car in this commercial and she's trying to be sexy. And she's like, the real question is, when you turn your car on, does it return the favor? And I'm like, what? I'm like, lady, I drive a pickup truck. If I turned on my truck and returned the favor, I would freak out. I'd be like, oh, stop it, that's awkward. But like, everything today, it's just all about sex. And you hear it so much, it begins to sink in. And the basic message is simple. You're young, you're gonna do it anyway. Seriously, if you're still a virgin, something's wrong with you. If you're not a virgin, it's too late for you anyway. And this is all you hear, and to me, it gets old. We want a better message, and God gives it to us. In the Bible, there's one place a man needs to know to love girls. It's out of Ephesians 5, where St. Paul says to the men, he says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church, handing himself over for her to make her holy. To do this, it's that Jesus was praying in the agony in the garden, said his sweat became like drops of blood and fell on the ground. 
I'm sure some of you will be doctors one day. You'll learn about this. It's called hematidrosis, which means under extreme stress, the capillaries in your skin can rise up, come in contact with sweat glands. They burst, and you bleed from the pores of your skin. Your body becomes a deep bruise, and then they'd scourge them on it. Scourging means they strip the guy naked. They wrap your arms around a pillar so the back is stretched out, and they'd come to him with wooden rods. At the end of the wood are leather straps. At the end of the leather are fishing hooks, fishing weights, pieces of glass and metal. And they would torture him till he's almost dead, and they'd put the crown of thorns on his head. They would have beat that into his head with a stick to keep it fixed. Then he'd carry the cross for about 600 yards. They'd strip him naked, pierce him probably through the wrists, and for three hours he hangs there, sacrificing himself for his bride, the church, us. And then St. Paul basically says, men, you want to get married one day? Prepare to love your bride just like this. And you guys are probably thinking like, crucify myself for a woman? How are you supposed to do that? It begins by not sacrificing women for the sake of ourselves. Because in high school, I always confuse love with lust, with girls. It's because the influence in my life back then of the pornography. And the thing is, when teenage girls find out how many guys struggle with porn, Girls don't get mad at us. They feel sorry for us. Because as a guy, porn for a guy is the most perfect way for a guy to shoot his future marriage in the head. Teaching me, you girls are things to be used for my kicks. When I get bored of you, I'll go to the next fantasy. High school, we laugh it off. Whatever. I'm not getting anyone pregnant. I'm not passing around diseases. We're just appreciating women. We laugh it off. Porn was everywhere growing up. Buddies had it. Your friends had it. First porn I ever saw, I was like eight or nine years old. We're riding our bikes around the neighborhood. We found a dirty magazine in the gutter. I'm like, what's that? I'm like, hmm, nice to meet you. And we're like, what do we do with it? My friend said, let's keep it. I said, well, yeah, but where do we put it? He said, let's put it at your house. I'm like, oh, good idea. So ride the bikes to my house, and we get there, and I'm like, I'm not gonna put it inside. I'm not getting busted. I had never seen porn before, but I knew something was wrong. So I said, I know what to do. So we ripped out all our favorite pictures, crumpled them up in little balls, and then we shoved them into bushes in front of the house so we could come outside and look at them when we wanted. Now, the problem is my dad trimmed the hedges Saturday afternoon and found corn growing on the plants out front. So yeah, kind of kind of got busted by the porn plant, but you know, we got back into it. Your buddies had it, we'd laugh it off. And I know right now, there's guys in the audience, in your mind you're thinking, whatever, I got some stuff on the internet, I got some videos on my phone, it's not a problem. Oh, a guy desperately tries to convince himself this is not a problem. What happens is a guy gets emasculated. Emasculation means when a young man is robbed of the ability to be masculine. Look at a crucifix, you see masculinity, the lover who empties himself for his beloved. Porn flips it backwards. So guys learn to empty ladies for the sake of ourselves. We missed the whole point why God made us men. We didn't even know we were looking at in the porn. I was at the airport in Los Angeles two, a couple years ago. Who do I bump into in the LA airport? It's Pamela Anderson, a big porn star, supermodel. And you know when she first posed for Playboy? She was about 18 years old. She went to the studios. I'll bet you they treated her like a queen, doing all her hair and all the makeup. She started to take the clothes off. She starts crying, bawling. <laughs> she finally pulls herself together. I guess they probably just redid the makeup around her eyes to make it look like she wasn't crying beforehand. Then they just took the nude photos. So when you're looking at porn, you're not looking at a naked body. You're looking at somebody's daughter who's probably sexually abused as a little girl, but we just laugh it all off and call ourselves gentlemen for enjoying it. Some of the girls in porn aren't even human beings. Maxim Magazine has paid computer companies more than 20,000 bucks a pop to generate fake women. Not airbrushed, fake. Legs are fake, eyes, ears, everything on a woman created with a computer. She does not exist in reality. And they've used these fake girls as their cover models. But they found out scientifically, if a guy gets addicted to internet porn and swimsuit magazines, they found a guy will actually train his own brain to expect all women to live up to his fantasy. And when he gets married, where does it leave a wife? Because when you look at porn, how long do you look at a picture? 15 seconds, 30 seconds. She could have the most beautiful body on earth and you're bored with her in less than a minute flat. And you do it for a couple years and you jump into marriage and you think you're gonna be captivated by one woman till death do you part, doesn't happen. My buddy in college had all this porn. 
And he's like, I'll just throw it away when I get married. You know, I went to his wedding, and that was a beautiful wedding. And he was divorced in three months. All he did was take all that lust he had for porn, look at his wife that way, and the marriage was over as soon as it started. And the solution isn't just throw away your porn. The solution needs to be a transformation of the heart. If the heart doesn't change, you get this stuff and you get married. One high school girl said to me, she goes, Jason, she said, I found out my dad looks at porn. She said, I used to look up to him. Now I can't even look at him. I thought he was a better man than that. And the solution, as I said, is not just to throw away the porn. The solution is the redemption of the sexual desires of a man. Not the annihilation, the perfection of a sexual desire. What does that mean? What we get told as guys, they tell us, well, just don't think about it. You know, do you think a lot about sex? Yeah, well, try not to think about sex. Oh, thanks, that's real helpful. I mean, that's like me telling you don't think about an elephant, okay? If you are thinking about an elephant right now, just don't think about an elephant. What are you thinking about? Elephant, elephant, elephant. Yeah, how, how's that working for you? If you try that with your sexuality, you'll go neurotic, you'll go nuts. The solution is the change of heart. And do you know what it looks like? Do you know the Catholic Church has a saint who spent all his money on prostitutes? This guy's name was Saint Vitalis of Gaza. He lived in Alexandria, Egypt. He would work all day under the hot sun. And after the day's work, he would take all the money he earned and he would bring it to a different prostitute every night. He got a list of where every prostitute lived in the great city of Alexandria. At the end of every day, he'd give one of them all of his wages. So she would spend the whole night with him and no other man. But instead of using these girls, he brought them the gospel. He prayed with them, prayed for them, told them they could start over. He converted a great number of prostitutes who became holy wives and mothers. One morning, he was coming out of a brothel, the house of prostitution, and a man saw him, recognized him as a Christian, was so sick of the hypocrisy, smacked him in the head with something and killed him. And the prostitute came out and said, well, you don't know what he had done for me, but it was too late and he had been martyred. Historians say when he was being buried, all of these former prostitutes came out of hiding, processing with candles and lanterns behind his body all the way to his gravesite to honor the man who saw their dignity when they had totally forgotten it. Now, I'm not recommending you try that as a method of evangelization. I mean, don't, don't be going to your priest and say, hey, you know, can we raise some money, get a prostitute for the youth group, you know, service work, you know, bad idea. But the point is, the redemption of the human heart is possible. This is the good news. And I don't think you guys out there are the problem. I think the young men are the solution to the problem. You ever wonder in America, is everybody just having sex over there? Is it really as bad as we see on TV? Is everybody doing it? Well, here's the latest statistics coming out. 2002, Newsweek magazine, cover story, the new virginity, why more teens are choosing not to have sex. 2004 press release, teenage virginity rate rises for 10 years in a row. 2005 People Magazine, young teens and sex, what's really going on? They showed there's more sex than ever on TV, but in reality, something big is changing. Latest statistics came out last summer, June 4th, 2010. The majority of American high school students are virgins. And this came out, 15 years of research, high school boys' sexual activity is now going down twice as fast as the girls. And the students hear this and they're like, what, there's another virgin in my country? There's another one? There's a change going on. One guy came up to me, because they're all afraid of this, some of them. One guy came up, he's like, can we talk? I'm like, yeah, what's going on? He's like, can we talk over there? I'm like, yeah, sure, we'll go over here. He's like, can we go all the way in the corner? And I'm like, all right. There's this dark little corner. I'm like, what's going on with you? And he's like, Jason, I'm a virgin. And I was like, I thought you were gonna tell me you had leprosy. I mean, this is a good thing. <laughs> more people are choosing it. People are starting over too. One girl started over, friend of mine. She was on a TV show called America's Next Top Model. And after the show was over, she got a phone call from an international men's smutty magazine. And they said to her, Leah, they said, Leah, we think you got that cute little country girl thing going on, but we think you could offer something a little more sultry, a little more seductive. She said, I can do sultry, I can do seductive. They said, well, come on out for a photo shoot. We'll take some pictures of your body then we'll give you $16,000 for that. And she's used to making that kind of money for modeling, so she goes to the photo shoot in New York City. And she said they pulled out a rack of clothes, and she, they told her to put on whatever outfit she wanted. 
So she put on a little outfit that she later described as anything but modest, and they start taking pictures. Halfway through the photo shoot, she just blacks out. And she says, the last thing I remember hearing is the voice of the photographer saying to her, Leah, Leah, are you okay? What's going on, are you all right, Leah? She said, all I know is I had died. I was standing before the presence of God in my little outfit with my hands open before me. I lifted them up to him as if to say, this is the last moment of my life and this is all I have to give you? All the beauty, all the talents you've given me, this is all I've got to give back to you, nothing? And she said, at that moment, God's head bowed down in disappointment. And at that point, she woke up and she said, I am done. She put her clothes on. They said, oh, Leah, where are you going? Look at these beautiful pictures we have of you. All these great pictures. Then there's one photo of her white as a ghost staring at the camera. And she said, I'm done. She put her clothes back on. They said, oh, here's a check, $16,000. She threw it in the trash. I don't want your money. She went back to the sacrament of reconciliation, got a clean soul. Now she travels the world teaching girls how you can look cute while still looking classy. There's a change going on. Modesty is making a comeback. I saw a, this on a magazine cover. Another one, Vogue magazine. It's always fun for me to purchase Vogue in public, so I bought one. And on the cover, it said, naughty versus nice. Why showing skin is no longer in. It's a big fashion article. How the whole belly button spaghetti strap thing, it's going out of style. Because the girl looks desperate. She looks like she's man begging. Guys get bored at her. She doesn't find love she's looking for. I know you girls want love, but from a guy's perspective, biggest way a girl ruins her chances of getting love is if she thinks dressing modestly is a joke. And I'll admit as a guy, I don't know the pressure you girls are under to look perfect and eat perfect. My wife was at a toy store. She saw a new Barbie doll they came out with, and she's like, oh, I have to buy that for Jason. So she bought me a Barbie doll. And I, shut up, it's for work. Now, now, there's no such thing as prostitute Barbie, but this comes pretty darn close. They've given her fishnet stockings. She's got a little short skirt, a little strapless top on. I don't know what you girls call these tops. It's like a napkin or tissue top or something for you. And the girls are told from the time that you're like in diapers, you know, behold womanhood. You know, you too can be a woman, all right? Now, for dinner tonight, have a grain of rice, okay? For, for dessert, have an ice cube, that's fair. Uh, and, because women, once you look like this, love is gonna come your way, and it's a joke. The standard is fake. You know, I'll put Barbie away for now, but, oh, <laughs> she's okay, still smiling. Uh, but the standard is fake. Do you know Cindy Crawford, the big model with Revlon makeup? Do you know Revlon thought she was too fat with, for her? So they, they made with computers her arms skinny for their advertisements. You girls grow up in a world where the supermodels can't live up to their own expectations. Real beauty isn't shown to you. Womanhood, it is shown to you. I know another girl auditioned to be on America's Next Top Model. She won the audition, she's so pretty. So she meets with the producers in like LA or New York City, and they said to her, okay, before the show starts, you need to know that on episode number five, we're gonna send you to Paris, France for a runway model show. And while you're modeling there, you're gonna cheat on your boyfriend. <laughs> She's like, nah, no, I'm not. I love him. They said, okay, you don't have to actually cheat on him. We're just going to make it look like you cheated on him. She said, no, I'm true to him. I'd never disrespect him like that. They said, you're for real going to be like this. You're off the show. Cut her on the spot. Never let her on. Instead, they got another girl to cheat on her boyfriend for the fifth episode in Paris. Real beauty isn't shown to you. What is shown to you is beer commercials, billboards, basically telling you girls, you know, you... Dude, you girls over there, dude, you're too fat. You know, and you girls, you're too skinny, and like the rest of you, you're all too fat and too skinny. You know, you're a real piece of work. I mean, constantly, girls being told that your body's disgusting. Hate your body. And a girl's desire to look pretty. She looks at some Seventeen magazine and thinks, well, if I wear that, I'll meet a nice guy. Sounds like it makes sense what happens is this. Girls, we love you, but we are so different than you with sexuality. We get seduced differently. I think girls get seduced through their ears like a boy gets seduced through his eyes. You girls get seduced by what you hear the boy telling you. Oh, baby girl, I've never felt this way about a girl before. 
oh, really? You know, it doesn't work with guys. I mean, look at the music that come out with for you girls, like Justin Bieber and Jonas Brothers, and like all the 12-year-old girls are all fainting at the concert, all these boy bands. You ever notice once there's no such thing as a girl band where all the high school boys flock to the concert together? Oh, it's Hannah Montana, I'm gonna die. No, no, it doesn't happen. Why doesn't it happen? Because we don't get seduced through our ears, we get seduced through our eyes. Perfect example. I'm eating dinner at a restaurant in Chicago. I walk into the guy's comfort room. First thing I see when I walk in, huge photograph of five women's sexy legs. First thing I thought is, you know, I wonder if I go across the hall to the girls' bathroom, kind of peek into the ladies' comfort room, is there gonna be like a huge photograph of five men's legs in the women's bathroom? You know, Probably not. In fact, I think just for fun, we should get some of the guys together after the talk today. Let's get a big photo of your hairy legs and let's stick it in the comfort room at the convention center. I, what would happen when girls walked in? They'd be like, bah! you know, or they'd vomit, but why? I mean, aren't, aren't boys cute? They are, but it's different. Now, if a girl doesn't understand these differences, she starts hiking up that skirt, wearing the tight, low-cut top, thinking she's cute in her outfit. Trust me, he's not looking at your outfit. If it's her sexual value that brings me to the girl, what do you want to get to know about her? I mean, come on, her intelligence, her personality, do you want to get to know her body? Now, if she gives you access to her body, thinking, well, this will make him like me more. What happens? A guy gets bored, he loses respect, and he moves on. She's left there thinking, well, maybe if I was skinnier, he would have liked me more. Maybe if I just did more with them sexually, he would have stayed longer. And guys get used too. Pressure goes both ways. On modesty, I'm not saying girls, you know, I want you to look as ugly as possible, you know. I don't want you to show up at your high school prom dressed up in some big old moo-moo, you know, and your boyfriend sees you and he's like, hey, <laughs> modesty, <laughs> you know, <laughs> looking cute tonight, you know, stay home, you know. No, it doesn't mean you look dumpy. Modesty means you look classy. Go and take the beauty of womanhood and use it. Teach boys about your dignity. Because I never knew how to treat a girl till I dated one in college who dressed modestly. Dude, it was captivating. You could take her seriously as a woman, but she wasn't trying to make boys stare at her body parts so she'd feel secure. She had a good dress like, boys, check this out. But like the way she dressed, it was like she's saying, boys, Frankly, I'm worth waiting to see, and you will not lift the veil over this body until you lift the veil over this face. Do you know how easy it is to respect a girl who's got that much self-respect? Because I promise you, you girls will never convince a boy of your dignity until you first convince yourself. And girls will be like, but Jason, there's no modest outfits at the stores. And I know it's hard to find modest clothes at the mall. You're not helpless. I read two high school girls in Arizona went shopping for their prom dresses for eight hours. Couldn't find anything. They went home mad. They wrote a letter to the department store. We high school girls are sick of the dresses you keep offering us for prom with the low cut and the slit up to my armpit. And they're like, why, why can't you carry dresses that treat us with class, modesty, mystery, I don't know, try some femininity? They signed their letter and then they had their friends sign it. Then they had 1,500 people sign this petition. They gave it to the department store. They had a meeting over it. Called the girls at home. Oh, this is the head of the department store. We had a meeting regarding your letter, and we came to the decision we'd like to hire you two girls as the fashion consultants for teenage design for the state of Arizona. Now, these two girls run the show. Proof. Girls can change the way the world looks at women. And girls will think, but Jason, if you can't dress sexy, can you flirt with a guy? Flirting depends you mean. I mean different things. Flirting for me. When I was in like grade two, if I liked a girl, I'd throw a rock at her. You know, it's like, it's like oh, dude, she's hot. I know, here, watch. She's like, pop, you know, like, yeah, and now she likes me. That's because she has a concussion. Well, that's her problem. Now, girl, girls are different. Girls flirt like this. When you girls were in like grade four, you'd see the cute guy and you'd be like, oh, he is so cute. And you get in the huddle with your girlfriends, got team efforts. Like, he's so cute, what should we do? And then, oh, they all start plotting together. And the, the first girl's like, I know, let's give him a note. Oh, that's great, get out some paper. <laughs> they rip out the paper. You, you write, you know, like, do you like my friend LaFonda? You know, yes, no, or maybe. It's like a survey, and he's gotta check the appropriate box and commit. Then, 
Then what happens, your girl's got like, I don't know, like 11, 12 years old. You start getting sophisticated with flirting. You'd see the cute guy, you'd be like, oh, he's so cute. You get in the huddle, he's so cute, what should we do? Your friend's like, I know. How about when he's leaving class, I'll shove you into him. Oh, that's good, shove me into him. Oh, that's good, good. And some of you apparently still doing this, but. Uh, you guys see the girls hitting each other and laughing? The reason girls think this is so funny, this is what the girls talk about when they go to the comfort room with like 30 of them at a time in there, yeah? They have couches in there, like sofas. They've got like, you know, you shove them to this, I'll come around the back, and I mean, it's just sick and wrong, but they do it. Then what happens? Girl, girl gets to what, I don't know, like year eight, not high school. Basically, as soon as you become a woman, the world will tell you, ladies, look, now that you become a woman, you got something the guys like. Better than nodes, get shoved into. You got your body. You can give it to the guy. He's gonna like you more. Girls always begin by thinking, okay, let me get this straight. So long as I'm technically not having sex with him, I'm being good. So hooking up and making out with different guys, that's not a big deal. Doing this with a guy, as long as I love him, it's not a big deal. Why? Well, because those other girls are worse than I am. And when it's all said and done, the girl convinces herself the priceless gift of her body, oh, that's not a big deal and something dies in the girl. She may go from boy to boy to boy, she never sits still. My brother and our kids, we play this game called lava, right? You take all the cushions off the couch, you throw them on the floor, and you have to jump from cushion to cushion. Like jump on the cushion, jump on the cat, jump on the cushion, but you can't step between them or you die. And sometimes girls date like that, where she goes from boy to boy to boy, but by the time she gets to college or after, she has no clue who she is. She defined her whole identity by the boys she clings to. But if a girl can get out of that, find her independence, she can find love. Because if she doesn't, she identifies her worth by the boys she clings to. And I'll tell you, she thinks she's in love with him. She's not. She's probably in love with the fact that he wants her when she doesn't even want herself half the time. But because she's afraid of being alone, she settles sometimes for almost anything. But girl, if you have to lower your morals to find love, then it is not love that you are finding. When she does, something dies in her. I read about a guy, lived in Texas. He's sleeping and his dog started barking. Guy came in the backyard, dog's barking at a bush. Guy's like, all right, it's a bush. It's been there for 10 years, you can shut up and go to bed. Goes to sleep, 2.30 the dog starts barking. Guy came in the backyard with a stick, come here pooch, smack, and beat the dog into submission, back to sleep. 2.45 the dog starts freaking out. The guy threw a fit, cocked a gun, came in the backyard, actually shot and killed the dog in the backyard, and went peacefully to sleep. But then what happened is the robber, who was hiding in the bushes, got out of the bushes, walked over to the body of the dead dog, came inside the guy's house, apparently killed him in his sleep and robbed everything that he owned. And that dog is like our conscience that tells us right from wrong. And I've said to my conscience, dude, shut up. Don't tell me I should be looking at that stuff on the internet. Don't tell me I should be doing this with a girl. Dude, shut up. I'd kill the voice and do it anyway and think I'm free. I'm not doing what my mom wants. I'm not doing what the church wants. I'm free. But then I always think afterwards, Jason, if you're so free, how come you're empty afterwards? If you're so free, how come you can't look her dad in the eyes whenever you go over her house? That's freedom. And it leads to the point where a girl will think, Jason, look, Jason, you have cute stories, but you don't get it. Look, Jason, I'm not a virgin. Or Jason, I have my virginity taken from me. Or Jason, something bad happened to me when I was a little girl. And would good guy like you're all talking about, as if I know any, would want a girl like me who's been through what I've been through? Jason, it's too late. Once it's gone, it's gone. Okay. I'll tell you one girl I know about. Two years old, she had her first memory. Is her dad abusing her mom. Her dad divorced, left the family. Girls, he's one of those guys out there, male enough to get a girl pregnant, but not man enough to be a daddy. So she's raised with no father. She gets to high school. She doesn't know how a gentleman should treat a lady. This football player asks her out. They start dating, and then he says to her, honey, Ray wants to start doing it. What do you guys think? They said, look, let's set some standards. Let's not sleep with our boyfriends for mm, six months. And if he can hold out no sex for that long, then I know he loves me, and then we'll sleep together. And now she looks back and thinks, six months? Six months is the price I put on my body. Six months of his time, attention, phone calls, that's love. So he held out for six months, they started sleeping together. He really lost respect for her. He started cheating on her, abusing her, physically abusing her in front of other guys who weren't man enough to protect her. Started emotionally abusing her. Girl, you're so fat, you're so stupid, you're so ugly. Stupid? She got straight A's in college. Fat and ugly? 
The girl was a kickboxer, voted the prettiest girl in the high school of 3,000 students. But he had her convinced she was fat and ugly. She was miserable. She said, those Saturday nights? She said, all my friends would say to me, it's all fun and games. But she said, you wake up the next morning and the fun and games are over. She said, I woke up sitting in my bathroom, flipping over my pregnancy test, scared to death. But she said, then I go to school that morning with the biggest mask on my face. Oh, I'm so happy. Put a mask on for my parents, one for church, one for the boys, one for my friends. She said, I was so sick of being fake. I don't know any way out. Her mom found her birth control pills. Said, look, you're going to a chastity talk. She goes, no, I'm not going to your stupid sex talk. I heard those before. Mom's like, I don't care. You're going. Forces her to go. I don't know who gave her the talk. It wasn't me. But she said that that guy got up there, and the one hour I just sat still, she said, my life did a 180. She said, the guy was so honest, blunt, and real. He didn't judge any of us. But she said, you know, it felt like he took my hand out of the audience and walked through my whole life with me. He had done all the stuff I had done, all sex, smoking, drinking. But she said, he had something I didn't have, and I wanted it back. He wouldn't have shamed himself. He had a backbone. I wanted that. So after the talk, she went up to him. And they talked for a while, and she took his advice. Start over. She went to the Sacrament of Reconciliation to get a clean soul, and then she wrote the list. 60 things she dreamed of in a future husband. Why never again would she settle for less? And then that weekend, the guys called her up. Hey, girl, want to hook up? We're going over to Andre's house. She wasn't stupid. She knew what they're after. So for the first time in her life, she turned them down. And she stayed home a little lonely. And then she wrote her first love letter to her future husband. I said no to them tonight out of love for you. I'm respecting my body this night out of respect for you. I can't wait for the day we're going to meet. With all my hopes and prayers and dreams, she signs it. Next weekend, they called her back. Hey, girl, where you been? Trying to be too good for us? They tried to make her feel guilty for taking care of herself for once. She turned him down again. No, another love letter. Every time she was tempted to go back that life, she'd read the old letters and write a new one. And she got stronger. And the stack of letters got thicker and thicker and thicker. Now, why do you think I know all this stuff about that girl? It's because she's the girl who gave me every single one of those letters on our honeymoon when I married her seven years ago. It's my bride. And thank you. And this, she's my wife, the mother of my kids. Like, can you imagine how grateful I am? She started waiting for me. Could you imagine what my life would be like today if she heard that one talk in high school and she blew it off? Chastity, abstinence, pff, what a joke, not for me. Do you think I ever would have met her? you think my marriage would exist? Do you think the little baby boy we just had five months ago would exist? Or my beautiful little girl I have? I got this little girl, she's a princess. She's perfect. I have biblical evidence from the Bible that my daughter is perfect. In, oh, you laugh. In the Bible, the number for perfection is the number seven. My little girl, born on 70707 at 707 in the morning. No kidding, man. I'm serious. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I planned that. Uh, and, and, and it was sweet. Like, when we found out that we were pregnant, specifically her, uh, you, go, you go to the doctors, you do a little ultrasound, see a little dude on the TV screen, and the very first one, the babies were as tall as a grain of rice, and you just watched their heart beating. It was awesome. Most of the ultrasounds stink. You, like, couldn't see anything. I'm like, is that his head? They're like, that's his butt. I'm like, oh, I like his dad. But now they have high-tech ultrasounds called 4D. They can now zoom in on your kid's face in color, live, 3D videos. They have videos now of children in the mother's wombs apparently laughing at something in there before they're ever born. And my wife and I, we got one of these ultrasounds of our son. He's five years old now, but during the ultrasound, he's as small as your cell phone. But then you zoom in on his little face, and this is what he looked like in my wife's womb five months before he was ever born. And it's like, do you get the point, though? This guy's whole life depended on a decision his mother made in high school to turn her life around. And when we got married, yes, I was a virgin when we got married. And you couldn't have paid me a million bucks to give it to anyone but my bride. She was not a virgin. But she was worth the wait. She knew it. I would have waited for until I was 50 to realize you're worth the wait. She started over. A lot of ways I did too. We don't want to end up divorced. So we did three things that will decrease your divorce rate. First thing, we would not live together before we get married. You know how couples do that today? Shacking up, cohabit, playhouse, test drive the whole thing, then get married? You go watch how they do. In America, they're twice as likely to end up getting divorced. Why? 
they say, we need to see if we're compatible with each other. <laughs> trust me on this one. And if she's a girl and you're a guy, trust me, you are not compatible. I figured that out so fast in marriage. I, yeah, you see who's laughing, all the old people. Uh, they know what I'm talking about. Dude, I knew we weren't compatible a week after we got married. We get back from our honeymoon, she moves all her stuff into my bathroom. Do you know what happens when a girl gets in a guy's bathroom when you get married? It's called the hostile takeover, all right? Because guys' bathrooms are perfect. Soap, shampoo, all you need. Yeah, she moves into town. I counted at one point, she had 27 different bottles of things in our shower, like 24. She got like, she has like pumice foot polish, like kneecap remover. She has like this, she has this body wash. It says exfoliating body wash with raspberry melon, apricot, kiwi, pork chop, applesauce. I'm like, oh, salad dressing, put some balote in there. Uh, and and it, it, it's like, and then they got razor blades everywhere. At one point she had seven razor blades. I'm like, that's enough to shave an orangutan. It's like what I married, Kong. And then I go in there once, she had these little blue packages and it said lemon, sage, body, butter. I'm like, body butter? What is that? Guys aren't into this. Like, Chris, do you have body butter at home? Don't answer the question. Uh, but the, but the point is that in marriage, you're not gonna be compatible. And that's just because girls are weird and guys are entirely normal, but that's obvious, but, but you're not gonna be compatible. But guess what? You better get ready and deal with it. Well, how? Sacrifice. Sacrifice? How am I supposed to know how to do that? It's like, well, guess what? Chastity, you get married, sacrifice is nothing new because you've been doing it for each other for years. So that's the first thing we did, didn't shack up. Second thing, we didn't sleep together before I got married. If I had sex with Kristalina before I married her, I'd be lying to her because my body would be telling her one thing. Oh, I've given myself totally to you. I'm all yours. Look, if I'm not the woman's husband, the embrace of sex is a lie. A movie came out where Tom Cruise had sex with Cameron Diaz. Afterwards, she said to him, don't you know when you make love to a woman, your body is making a promise to her whether you do or not. The promise of sex is I am all yours. And if they're not married, it isn't true. And some guys will tell me, oh, but what if it's not like that? Some cheap one night stand and you're drunk all over her. What do you really care about this girl? How come you can't sleep with her if you really love her? Really love her. What's it mean to love a girl? It means you do what's best for her. Is it best for her to wake up tomorrow? <gasps> my pregnant, is my mom gonna find out? You know, I spoke at a high school once that had 87 girls pregnant on campus. That didn't include the grade seven and eight students, brought the number of pregnancies over 100. But could you imagine what sex would be like if boys were the ones who could get pregnant? I'd like to see that. I mean, you know, I can see all the high school football players saying to the girlfriends, well, I'm not ready for sex. Coach would kill me if I got pregnant on the football team next year. You know, oh my, I can't run down the field like that. That's not gonna work out. No. You know, but, but, but he'll just let her go through the fear. What, what do you think her future is not important as his is? And some guys will tell me, oh man, well, I'm telling you, I really love this girl I'm sleeping with. L look, if a guy loves a girl who he's sleeping with, how come if they're in bed together at her house and her dad comes home, the guy will jump out of like a five story window rather than face her dad? I know, this happened to a friend of mine. My friend John, he's over at my friend Michelle's house. They're up in her bedroom messing around. They weren't even supposed to be seeing each other. Her dad was supposed to be out of town on business. He comes home early, sees John's car in front of his house. Whoa, boom, he busts. He's coming upstairs. They hear him coming upstairs. My friend John is freaking out because he's trapped. There's nowhere to go. So he's like, eh, where can I hide? He's like in your closet in the microwave. Where can I fit? There's nowhere to go. Now Michelle's bed is like six inches off the ground. So he's like, honey, I'm going under there. And he dives under the bed and he wiggles under the mattress. And he's like, <gasps> and the bed's like moving up and down in his chest. And, and the dad busts the door open, boom. Where's John? Now, now Michelle, she's real smooth. Michelle's like, John who? It's like, sweetheart, the bed's levitating behind you. There's a clue. So dad comes up in bed, looks underneath it. Oh yeah, my friend John is on the floor in the corner shivering like a rat under the bed. It's like, what is he doing there? I mean, if he really loves this girl, why does he know, boy, you better hide from the man who loves her the most? Because he knows in the depths of his heart that this has nothing to do with love and sacrifice. It's about lust and pleasure. If it were about love, 
how proud he'd be to show the father how he loves the daughter. But as it is, he hides. Why is her dad like that? So uptight and protective? Because he's not naive. He knows the price she's going to pay. They studied here 10,000 girls. When a girl starts having sex, what happens in her life? Now, they studied girls from the ages of 12 to 26. They found if a girl starts having sex when she's 12, that's like year seven or whatever, those girls on average go on to sleep with about 21 different guys in their life. If she starts having sex when she's 13 or 14, she'll probably have about 14 lifetime sexual partners. Starts having sex at 15 or 16, she'll probably have eight, next one seven. Numbers go down according to how long she waits for sex. But unless she turns her life around, the girl is now more likely to have more breakups, STDs, out of wedlock pregnancy, become a single mom, live under the poverty level, have a divorce, have an abortion, be depressed. This goes on and on. The longer a girl waits for sex, the happier her life will be. And it doesn't mean you'll have a terrible life, you're not a virgin. My wife's happy. All it means, how can men learn this and think they're loving a woman by exposing her to this? And with Crystal and I, this is not why we save sex for marriage. You think we practice chastity because of this? It's like, well, honey, I'm afraid of increasing your rates of living under the poverty level, honey. We certainly can't do that tonight. I mean, no. The reason we waited is simple because I love her, and love can wait to give, but lust can't wait to get. If you're sexually active right now, or just doing sexual stuff, take it out, and you'll see if it's real love. We did a big public high school in America, 1,000 freshmen, 1,000 sophomores. After the assembly, the senior runs in the assembly hall. He's like, dude, who told my girlfriend all about abstinence? I was like, me. And he's like, man, I go, what's the matter? And it turns out he was a senior and his girlfriend is a freshman. He was one of these older guys who doesn't have enough social skills to date a girl his own age, so he tries to get lucky with the little ones. But what's the deal with you girls and older guys? Like, how many of you girls in here are 16 years old? Put your hands up, 16 year old girls. Put your hands up. Put it, you're a boy, we'll work on that later. Uh, girls, 16 year old girls, put your hands up. Keep them up there. How many of you girls are currently pursuing a 13 year old boy? Oh, I'm proud of you. Uh, now, how come girls laugh at that? But if a guy's older, she doesn't think twice. First reason it happens is girls mature faster than guys do. And I know you girls are thinking, oh, that's a shocker. Uh, but you think about it. She sometimes gets bored of the boys her own age. But then along comes Mr. College Guy to the high school girl. She thinks, oh, he's older than me, he likes me. But what ends up happening, she doesn't realize some of these guys know what to say to a girl. They'll say, girl, I, I would never pressure you to do anything sexually that you're not ready for. I totally respect that. And even if we didn't do it tonight, that's okay. I just like being with you. And she's like, oh, you see, he's so sweet. But if you watch it, he'll sexually take from her everything she's willing to give him. He doesn't guard her innocence, he's wearing it down. He's not a spiritual leader, he's like a spiritual midget, you know, but she can't tell. Her girlfriends tell her, can't you see he's bad for you? It's like she's deaf. She's like, I know he has problems, but he smells good, so I can't break up with him. I don't know what to do. And, and she just gets burned. But when it's real love, I will tell you, real love will bring you closer to everybody who loves you, your family, your friends, and God. When it's not real love, you just get plucked away from all three. Remember that guy ran in the auditorium? Who told my girlfriend about abstinence? I go, me, what's the matter? He goes, man. He said, I just saw my girlfriend in the hallway after your talk. She looked all happy. So I said, where you been the last hour? And she said, oh, enjoying my new purity. And he said, so I came in here to see what happened to her. I go, well, did, you can sleep with her again one day. Marry her. He goes, oh. I go, isn't she worth waiting for? He goes, no. It's the love test. Only if a girl has that virtue of purity will she be able to weed out the boys who do not deserve her. And I promise you girls, the boys are gonna come saying they love you, but this will test them. Sometimes it proves his love. One guy came up to me about two months ago. He said, Jason, he said, after your talk, he said, I went back to class. And he said, I couldn't hear anything the teacher was saying and because your, my mind was so locked in on what you said. And he said, but after your talk, he said, honestly, he said, I've been having sex with this girl at the college. He says, you know what? I really love her. He said, I'm serious. I can see my whole life ahead of me with her. But he said, we're been having sex. And he said, I know we shouldn't be doing that. And he said, so this is what I did for her during class to show her what she means to me. And he said, I don't, think, I don't know if you're going to think I'm corny for doing this, but I wanted to show you. Opens up his notebook, and there's a piece of paper filled front and back with all his handwriting. And at the top of the paper, 
It said 100 ways to love Kelsey without having sex anymore. He emailed me three days later, and he said, I'm almost done with the 100 things. I'm going to turn it into 1,000. He said, thanks, man. This is going to make all the difference in the long run. Could you imagine the stability of a man's marriage if he knows a thousand forms of intimacy before becoming sexual? The problem is we got so many weak marriages because we learn only one form of intimacy, sexual, and we know no other way of appreciating and expressing love to a woman. And so purity will prove love. And I promise you girls, some boys are gonna say to you, girl, if you love me, if you really love me, you do it with me, you give it to me if you love me. Girl, do you know that if he loved you, he wouldn't be asking for it in the first place? And if you love him, you can't give him what he wants because you're afraid of losing him. That's not love, it's insecurity. Love doesn't give people whatever they want. I came downstairs looking for my kids once. I'm like, hey guys, where are you? Silence. I'm like, come on, that's not funny. John Paul, Colby, Mary, where are you? Silence. Now when my kids are quiet, it means they're either sleeping or doing something illegal. Those are the only options we have on the table. I know they're up no good. I look in the kids' kitchen. One of the kids, it looks like, put a chair against the refrigerator, climbed up it, opened up the door, went in the freezer, and there was a gallon of ice cream missing from the freezer. And I'm like, I don't know who that is. Colby, the five-year-old. I'm like, Colby, I'm like, I know where he is. I go in the kids' playroom. I look underneath the slide. Sure enough, under the slide. We have this little cave. Sure enough, in the cave, there he is, fat monster. He's completely naked, eating the gallon of ice cream out of his lap. I'm like, oh, I'm like, give it to me. He's like, oh, here comes dad. I grab his fat little ankles. I'm pulling on his butt on the floor. He's still sliding on the butt, scooping it in. And, you know, I pull it away. I'm like, give that to me. He pulls it back. He's like, you don't love me. I'm like, I don't love you. I'm like, you're lactose intolerant. I'm like, you'd be on the toilet for a week if I let you eat that much, boy. Of course I love you. Because I love you, you can't have what feels good because it just isn't good for you. It's the same principle behind abstinence. Abstinence, chastity, purity. Why do you think my wife and I, three days before we got married, we're still not having sex? It's like, come on, you guys are gonna get married anyway. Why wait? Why did we wait? Was it because of fear? Oh no, you know, do you think we were going on dates afraid of sexuality? You think I dated my fiance thinking, oh, well, I can't have sex with her. I'm going to get pregnant, dive an STD, and go to hell. I can't do that. I mean, no. Pregnancies are real. STDs are real. Hell is real. But perfect love ought to cast out all fear. Purity for a man? It's not about following a bunch of rules so you don't go to hell. It's about wanting heaven for the woman that you love. And if you can get that, boy, you get the big picture. So that's the second thing we did, save it for marriage. Third thing for solid marriage. One of the beauties of self-control, you don't even have to worry about birth control. Even in marriage, no way on God's green earth will I put my wife's body on that junk. How disrespect. What is her fertility? A disease? Oh, yeah. Let me give her some drugs and pills to make her more available for me. I mean, high school girls, you're so lied to about birth control. You know what they don't tell girls when they get birth control? Does ever say to you, hey, sweetheart, here's your birth control pills, and before you take them in the morning, you might want to know you're increasing your risk of developing breast cancer with every birth control pill you take. Some doctors like, that's not true. Really? Hmm, not true. Well, then why does the company, companies that make birth control admit that it's true? The Mayo Clinic, the World Health Organization, openly admits that it's true. But they don't tell the girls that. Oh, you don't want the pill? Okay, let's give you girls the shot. It's called Depo Provera. And before they stick the needle in you girls, make sure they tell you the company that makes Depo Provera is being sued for more than $700 million because it thins out the girls' bones. They got girls in America now, 20 years old, with the bones of a 60-year-old woman in their body because they took Depo for too many years as a teenager. And in California, if you're a child molester or a rapist, you know what they do to you? They put your butt in prison where you belong. And you know how they punish you when you're there? I love it. According to the California government website, sex offenders in California now may be punished by Depo Provera treatment. And the prisoner shall continue getting injections to the treatments no longer necessary. They inject child molesters with girls' birth control in California. Why? It'll reduce his desire for sex. But you know who they won't give it to now? Dogs. Veterinarians refuse to give it to dogs. They said that is not safe enough to give to our house pets. But they'll give it to any girl for birth control. Big thing they have now is a birth control patch. It's a little sticker the girl puts on. Hormones go through her skin and it's killed more than 23 girls in America so far. 
Oh, you don't want the patch? Let's give you girls something new called Implanon. It's a plastic stick about this long, real thin like a matchstick. They just cut the girl's arm open, slide it under your skin, sew your skin shut, and it sinks hormones into your beautiful body so you don't get pregnant. And if you're interested in that, I've got the information right here that comes with the drug. It says, ladies on Implanon, call your doctor right away. If you start coughing up blood, you go completely blind or unconscious. <laughs> Like, what? It's like, how is she supposed to make the phone call? Has anyone seen my cell phone around here? It's like, you kidding me? Coughing up blood? Dude, what? what was so wrong with her fertility in the first place? I mean, your fertility, girls, is a gift. It's not some kind of disease. I asked a bunch of high school guys once, hey, guys, what's the number one sexually transmitted disease? One guy was like, ooh, I know, pregnancy. I'm like, no. I'm like, kids are good. And this whole idea of pushing birth control on the young people, I mean, that bill that's heading down its way towards you, the reproductive health bill, man, you got no idea what this will do to a country. I know because I've been around the world, and the groups are just pushing it against all these countries, and everywhere it gets in, the same thing happens. And they sell it to you, oh, well, we need to offer women more reproductive health choices, and it will help with poverty. Really? Well, how much does a birth control pill really fill up your stomach? Is that a really a good meal? Well, no, no, no. Well, you see, poverty will be better because there will be smaller families. Oh, really? Is that the solution to poverty, getting rid of innocent poor children? No, I'll tell you, the solution to poverty is to get rid of the corrupt rich politicians. That's the solution to poverty. And so, this, and they, and they make you feel so little. Oh, little Philippines. Oh, you third world country. You need to grow up like us developed nations, the United States of America. And we will show you how to have reproductive health. Really? Oh, Mr. Obama, you want to teach other countries about reproductive health? Well, how about we stop aborting 3,700 babies every single day? I think that would help if you have a little more authority on reproductive health. Oh, the birth control in America? Out of control. So many women are on birth control. Do you know who's having problem having little babies now? Fish. That's right. Not making this up. Hormonal birth control passes through a woman's body into the bathroom. The sewage goes into the water treatment plants. Water treatment facilities are not capable of filtering out the synthetic sex hormones of female contraceptive pills and shots and implants. So the hormones of synthetic sex things like progesterone and, and, and est estradiol, all this stuff, get into the water system and they get inside the fish. Now we have in America sterile fish, transgender fish, not making this up. They've got male fish, female reproductive parts. They can't mate with each other. They're having fertility problems. So they go to the environmentalists who love our environment so much. And they say, do you know what your birth control pills are doing to the environment? What will you do about these poor fish? They're like, ah, oh, well, <laughs> I guess the fish have to have smaller families. Well, maybe we can give them Viagra in the water system too. That'll take care of the problem. It's like, really? Oh yeah? And, and, and we're the experts on reproductive health? Oh yeah. You know what? You know who we look to, honestly? I see the newspaper articles about the Philippines in America. And do you know what they say? I've got them in my backpack right there. Low rate of HIV in the Philippines is a puzzle. Scientists in America cannot understand why the Philippines had such a low rate they hardly use the condom, how can they not have a bunch of AIDS? Well, they have this little thing out there called morality, okay, and that really helps. And so, what's, understand this reproductive health thing is like beating against the cliff. Imagine the Philippines like a village on top of a cliff, and these bills are coming up, and then you're pushing them away. A couple years later, it'll come back under a different name. Oh, this is the Responsible Parenthood Bill. No, that's called Irresponsible Barrenhood. Go away. And then it washes away. And then it comes back. Oh, reproductive health. Health? Really? Breast cancer, coughing up blood, infertility, and fish that have both genitals? No, sorry, not health. And you got to understand, this thing is going to try to erode the very foundation of your culture. And God willing, through prayer and fasting and, and responsible activism, we can push this thing away. But I promise you it's coming back. Fortify your politicians through prayer. 
I'll bet you there's even politicians, dare I say, that may even be in favor of this bill because they sincerely think it'll help the Philippines. Pray that their hearts might be open to the truth. Pray that they might be open to grace. It is the very future of your nation is at stake. We should not be leading you in that direction. The Philippines, in my opinion, is the global leader when it comes to this stuff. And we have a lot to learn from you. So, now, and, and they will tell you, well, you know, you're gonna need to teach safe sex to those kids in the school. If you don't teach them safe sex, oh, it's gonna be a nightmare, all these STDs. Really? Big, big problems? Oh, they're gonna get pregnant if you don't pass out condoms in schools? How about this? Public high school, Colorado, United States, America. Let's teach safe sex. Give all the kids condoms. Passed out condoms the whole school. Within a year, they had about 100 students pregnant on campus. It doesn't work. It's never worked. When it comes to STDs, nobody even has an idea what's going on. Everywhere I go, I ask students, what is the number one sexually transmitted disease? And nobody knows. And I know some of you heard my talk this week. For those of you who've never heard me speak, what do you think's the number one sexually transmitted disease? What would you say? AIDS, no. Syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, no. Nobody gets it. I was in Michigan, I asked 10,000 students, nobody knew. Philadelphia, they didn't know. I asked them in Belize, Central America, Australia, New Zealand, England, nobody knows. They're like AIDS, chlamydia, syphilis, herpes. There's always a guy in the corner, he's like, crabs? And I go, no, it's not crabs, stay away. But what is it? Not AIDS. HIV, the virus that leads to AIDS, is less than 1% of all the STDs in the world. Number one STD has killed more women than AIDS has, but they don't want to talk about it. It's not herpes, it's not chlamydia. Some of these are scary, because when girls get STDs as teenagers, most of the time, you don't know you have one. You feel fine, you don't get tested, then you get married when you're 24 and try to have a baby, the disease could have taken away your ability to have kids. This mother came up to me, Jason, will you tell those teenagers about me? I said, yeah, what? She said, Jason, hmm. She said, I got married as a virgin to a man who'd been sexually active before we met. But she said, when we got married, she said, my husband honestly didn't know he was asymptomatic, which means you don't show symptoms. She said, on our honeymoon night, she said, my husband honestly didn't know he was infected with herpes, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and human papillomavirus, and he had no symptoms. So they got married, she got herpes. Had two babies, they got herpes. Gonorrhea and chlamydia scarred her fallopian tubes. She's sterile, no more kids. HPV caused cervical cancer. She had to have an operation on that too. And do you know what her husband was thinking, sleeping with other women before he met her? It's all good, because you know who, no one's getting hurt. Yeah, who's gonna be hurt? Your wife and your kids, they're gonna pay the price. Number one STD is HPV, the last one she had, human papillomavirus. 1% of people who are sexually active get genital warts from that. Most people don't get that symptom, so they think they don't have it, but it can cause cervical cancer in you girls. And this is getting so widespread in the United States. How many girls have HPV in the States? They did a study of teenage virgin girls. How many virgins in this study got HPV from the first teenage boy they slept with? 46% of the girls got it from the first teenage boy they slept with. Most of the time it goes away, but it's getting so widespread. College girls in America, 45% of college American women have HPV. How is this even possible? Scientists explain it. They've never done this before. Study the sexual activity of an entire high school. Who had sex with who? Here's they found out. Half the school, not having sex. Half the school was having sex. But here's the kicker. Half of the students who were having sex, without knowing it, were all connected to each other in a web of 288 students. 100 of them only had one partner. That's not the question. Who'd she sleep with before me? And who was he with before her? Well, they found out, mapping out the whole school, showing if you slept with someone from this campus, theoretically, you could be in bed with one-fourth of the entire student body through a single act of intercourse. This is how the thing is spreading. So why don't they talk to you about it? One basic reason, safe sex is false. It's an idea, if you put on a condom, you won't get AIDS. And you know what? It works pretty well with HIV risk reduction of 85%. Here's the problem, it doesn't work with HPV because the virus is spread differently from skin to skin contact. Any skin to skin sexual contact from mid thighs to mid abdomen area can transmit the virus, including hand to genital contact. Our government admits this. 
Our Centers for Disease Control says this, the scientific evidence is not enough to recommend condoms as the way to prevent HPV. I read this, I'm like, but you just taught the world safe sex for 30 years and now you come out and admit it's medically not true? They say, well today, we offer strategies to avoid HPV. I love this. Strategy number one is be abstinent, don't have sex, okay. Strategy number two, this is my favorite. If you choose to be sexually active and you don't want HPV, choose a partner who is not infected with HPV. Well, hey, <laughs> cutting edge research. Uh, they have walked away from safe sex. They know scientifically they can't back it up. And I'm not telling you this to frighten you, you have a right to know it. If anyone ever tells you, hey, make sure to use protection next time. Protection, yeah, go tell that to a friend of mine because he used the condom every time. And how many pregnancies did he cause? Seven of them. And how many moms did he marry? Not one. That's not protection, it's child abuse. Real protection is purity. You protect your body, your soul, your future spouse and kids. That's protection. Now I hate discussing the STD stuff. So where do you go from here? Guys, girls, ladies, girls, take off after the seminar, go to the, the tiny little mall next door there and buy a white candle. Let your husband light that on your wedding night as a sign of the purity that you maintain from this day to the day he lifts your veil. On our honeymoon, my wife and I went to a place called Bora Bora in Tahiti, tropical paradise. We had an overwater bungalow, which means your hotel room is over the ocean and you have a glass floor underneath so you can see the fish. I saw an eight foot shark swim by and I thought that was cooler than she did, but we're sitting there and it's midnight. She says, Jason, I have a present for you. I'm like, give me it. And then I open up the box and in it was a heart shaped white candle with an untouched wick as a sign of the purity she's been guarding for love of me before she ever laid eyes upon me. To realize girls, you are worth the wait. And from this point on girls, you quit being afraid. Boys will leave you unless you give them something sexual. Girls, turn the tables and you let the boys be afraid. They're gonna lose you unless they know how to respect you. And girls will be like, but Jason, there's no good guys out there. Jason, guys are jerks. Jason, guys are pigs. They're dogs, they're giraffes, they're antelope, you know. Three girls in Philadelphia came up and they said, Jason, guys are jerks. I go, no, there's lots of good guys. And they're like, guys are jerks. And I'm like, whoa, issues. I'm like, easy, tiger. And I asked her, I go, look, you dating anyone? She's like, yeah. I go, well, tell me about him. And we talked for an hour and a half and she finally admitted, he is a drug dealer. He swears a lot, drinks a lot. Uh, he's cheated on her and her parents hate him, but I couldn't figure out why. Parents are so unfair. And then the next girl jumps in. She goes, Jason, all guys are jerks. I said, no, there's so many good gentlemen out there. I meet them all the time. She goes, they're all jerks. She said, we were at a party three weeks ago and these guys came up behind a girl and they poured a beer on her head. She's a girl. Two weeks ago, same party, they poured a beer on another girl's head. Last weekend, same party, they poured a beer on another girl's head. See, guys are jerks. I'm like, girls, what are you doing this weekend? They're like, oh, we're going to the party. And I'm like, okay, well, let's try to figure out where your problem's coming from. That's why I beg you girls to set the standard high because it's the patient girl that gets the prize. And girls say, but Jason, what if I find a good man? He said, I like him, but my parents don't think I should date or they don't like this guy. What am I supposed to do? I'll tell you one high school couple I know, seniors that fell in love and they started writing love letters to each other. Instead of just texting, handwriting all their love letters back and forth, they stacked up over a hundred pages of love letters. And one day the boy's hanging out at the girl's house and the dad says, hey, uh, young man, he said, uh, what is this I hear about you having such strong feelings for my daughter? And the kid's like, oh, dude, your daughter, she's the most amazing, beautiful thing that God ever made on earth and I can think I'm gonna spend the rest of my life. And dad's like, hey, you know, I agree. She is the most beautiful thing God ever made, but I'd really rather she focus on getting ready for college and focusing on herself instead of dating right now. And the boy saw the wisdom of what he was saying and, you know, agreed to honor him, but he, he was, his feelings were so strong for this girl, he didn't keep to his word. And he said, and he started dating her secretly behind the dad's back. And the boy said to the girl, he said, you know what? I can't do this to your dad. He said, I really do respect your father. And if he were to ever find out that we we're doing this stuff, man, that would kill all the trust. It just wouldn't be right. But before they could tell the dad the truth, the dad caught them lying and the whole thing was destroyed. And they were crying, it was a huge mess. And the boy said to the dad, he said, my feelings for your daughter are so strong, I can't just be friends with her. I've either gotta have a relationship or nothing at all. So if I can't date her, 
I'm gonna ask her to give back to me all the love letters I ever gave to her. And she handed them over and he said goodbye. They didn't get to say goodbye when they went off to college, but that night he came back to her house. And in the middle of the night, he buried in her front lawn a shoebox on the ground, buried a shoebox filled with all the love letters they had written. And he buried the box underground and then he looked up to her house at night and he said, God, God, if it's your will to bring me back to this girl, I know you're gonna do that. But God, if you have someone better in the world for me, her than I am, then God, all I want is what's best for her and I trust you. Uh, and he left. Two years, long years went by and then his telephone rang in his dorm in college and it was the girl's dad. And the dad's like, son, do you remember me? And he's like, yeah, I remember you. And the dad said, you know, he said, I'll never forget the mark you left on my family, that you had so much integrity to let go of my daughter when I know she meant the whole world to you. To trust in my father's love for my daughter, he said, you know, that took a lot of integrity to stick by your word these two years. And he said, I honor that. And he said, I'd be honored to have a son like you in our family one day, so if you'd like to court my daughter, I know she's more than happy and ready. And he was thrilled, called up the girl, they started dating again. They dated for a year and a half, and then on Christmas morning, he had a little surprise to give her. And the whole family knew it was gonna happen, and she's excited, she's like, oh, what is this? And she opens up a little box, and inside, it says a red maple tree. And she's like, oh, it's a, it's a tree. <laughs> I really wanted a tree for Christmas, honey. And he, he said, yeah, I thought you liked the tree. Uh, and, and he says, you know, why don't we go plant the tree? And she's like, no, it's like 30 degrees, it's snow. He found the box, pulled off the lid, and then with, he pulled out the final letter he had ever written to her, which she had never seen before, which was his marriage proposal. And on one knee, he asked her to be his bride, and today the two are married and raising a family together. God honors those who honor him. And I know it's tough, but the fact is it works. And so, and one thing as women, I would ask you girls to do for each other, build what's going on in that girl's home. You don't know what's going on in her life. You take the labels off and give people the freedom to start over if they want to. Guys, where do you go from here? Guys can have different reactions to a chastity talk. First reaction is like make fun of it and blow it off. Girls, you don't know this. In high school and college, we want to impress you, but I'm sorry, we'd rather impress the guys sometimes. And if I think that those guys will look down on me as not a man if I'm being pure, then I'll just be quiet about my values and just melt into the rest of the guys. But what's needed from a man is authenticity. Chastity demands this. You can't be one guy on Saturday night and a different guy Sunday in church. One guy in front of her parents and their backs are turned, you become somebody else. It demands you have no duplicity. What's needed, authenticity. We were at a school, they had the best basketball team in America. And after the talk, the star of the team came up to me. This guy's like 11 feet tall. And he walks up, he's like, yo, can we talk in the back? And I'm like, yes, come with me. And I took his hand and we went back here. I'm like, well, what's going on up there? He goes, man, he's like, be honest with you? He's like, huh? He's like, I've been with so many girls, I've done so much stuff. He's like, huh? He's like, I knew every time I was killing her, but she wanted it, I wanted it. Half the time I was drunk, I just blamed it on the beer. And he goes, nowadays, he said girls are more aggressive than the guys half the time. Oh, you should see the nasty text messages they're sending around school. And he said, but after your talk, he goes, it's different. He goes, I wanna be faithful to my wife before I meet her. He goes, I don't wanna get married, giving my wife all these memories I have of teenage girls I'll never see again when I graduate. He's like, but how do you start over when you've been where I've been? He said, when you're with the girl and she says she's ready for sex, how do you say no to that? I said, look, if she thinks she's ready for sex and she's not ready to be a mom, she's got no clue what she's talking about. In Boston, seventh grade boy came up to me. Jason, my girlfriend and I have talked and we're ready. I'm like, he's 12, I'm like, ready? I go, are you ready to be a father? And he's like, well, no, just for sex. And after explaining to him the shocking connection they discovered between the two, I said, look, you know I'm married, I got a couple little kids. I go, you know what you don't know about me? Is that our first baby has had so many medical problems. He's had to be in all these different hospitals. And the first two years of being a new dad, I spent $30,000 in medical bills on him so I'd have the best doctors on earth taking care of my sick boy. And you got what it takes to be a good father. You ready for sex? He opens up his wallet, shows me his money. He's like, I have $5. And I'm like, buy her a pizza. I mean, 
If you love her, you prepare and you sacrifice. And I'll grant you, this is not easy, but purity is a gift from Jesus Christ and he'll give it to you if you ask for it. Where do you ask for it? Confession, go get it. Sacrament of reconciliation, go. Some people are like, oh no, I'm not going to confession. What if I tell the priest what I did? It's like, what do you think, you invented a sin in the Philippines or something? And he's like, what did you say? I've never heard of that before. Let me call the Vatican. I think we've got a new sin in the Philippines. Like, trust me, dude. He's heard it before. And I asked a priest once, Father, what's it like when students come to you and you thought they're all good and then you found out they made big mistakes? Does that change the way you look at them? And the priest said, honestly, it does. He said, because after confession, I begin to look up to them because they care more about what God thinks about them than what man thinks about them. And he said, that is humility, and as a priest, I admire that. Go to confession. Today, there's gonna to be about five priests. That should be enough to handle 10,000 confessions. Uh, and so, just make five lines of 2,000 people, uh, and go to the sacrament today. Get the slate wiped clean. Teenagers as well as adults. Teenagers, if you can't drive to confession, go to your dad. Hey, say, dad, will you take me to confession? And say, hey, dad, when was the last time you went to confession? He'll be like, oh, I was 12. It's like, Dad, that's unacceptable. You're going too. Bring the family. Go to confession. You get made new. Gets, and it, you don't just get your sins taken away. Confession gives you an ocean of graces to avoid those sins in the future. Go. Get made new. Sin, don't run from mercy. Second thing to stay strong is the Eucharist. Never leave the Mass. My wife and I go to Mass every day because every grace I need to love my bride, I get straight from the most blessed sacrament. Third thing was big for me was devotion to Our Lady, the rosary. As a guy, you look at porn, it'll take five seconds to look at porn, and I'm telling you, it'll feel like it takes 15 years to forget what you saw. So for me, it was devotion to the virgin that taught me how to look at a girl again. So get that rosary, and I would recommend always keep one in your pocket. It'll always remember, mind you, to pray. And to help you live out this lifestyle, we have launched for you a website. Because I know after my talk, you have questions. You're wondering, well, when should I start dating? How do I know if he loves me? How do I know if I'm infected with HDTV? Or what is that virus again? Well, how do I do that? How do that? So, so what we did is launched the website chastity.com, C-H-A-S-T-I-T-Y.com. When you get there, click the button Facebook. If you wanna to go to our Facebook, click the button that says YouTube. When you click the button YouTube, you'll find videos of me, my wife, America's Next Top Model, a National Football League quarterback, all talking about chastity. Put these things on your Facebook, put them in your tweets, evangelize your friends and let us do the talking. And the website, chastity.com. We also have books, DVDs, resources. Uh, we brought some of them today. We can't sell them because we couldn't bring enough to actually sell because the how much it costs to fly them on the plane over here. But I'll just run down a couple of things that we got there if you're interested. Newest one, super happy about. My wife and I for five years have been working on one book for girls. And it just came out on Valentine's Day. And it's called How to Find Your Soulmate Without Losing Your Soul, 21 Secrets for Women. Now, if we weren't able to bring out a bunch of these, we're going to be donating them to a bunch of the high schools and colleges. But if you do want one, on the back, there's these little cards. Um, back there, they're gonna be sitting, I think, at a table over here, and it has the website, howtofindyoursoulmate.com. You can get the books, or you could get it at chastity.com. Other books, I wrote If You Really Love Me, it's the top 100 questions about dating and chastity. We also did a prayer book called Pure Faith. In fact, I'll, I don't need to carry these back on the plane, I'll give out free ones. Who wants a prayer book? So, here, a prayer book right there, so, whoop, oh, it's, it's gonna leave a mark. Um, if You Really Love Me is the question with a Q&A book for guys, so there you go. Um, and uh, this is the how to find your soulmate. Meh. You're a boy. You don't need it. Uh, so, so there you go. Whoa. Oh my. That. that meow, meow. Uh, then, this one is for parents. Yeah, you better put your hands down, girl. Uh, it's called raising pure teens. I won't throw it that far, I'll put some parents' eye out. Uh, and then we have a whole curriculum called a Theology of the Body for Teens. Uh, and we're gonna donate all this to a school, but uh, all that stuff is on the website, chastity.com, if you're interested in that stuff. But the best thing I have to give all of you is this. As of today, I have thousands of people praying for you. 
The audiences I spoke to this week, most of them I asked, would you pray for all the students and people we speak to this week in the Philippines? My wife and I have been praying for you. I sent out a message on Facebook to over 2,000 people. Will you please, it was actually 3,000 people this morning, put on Facebook, would you guys all please pray for the people we'll be speaking to today in Manila. They're praying for you. I've written letters to over 100 convents of nuns. That's like the ammunition of the church right there. I asked for their prayers. I even wrote a letter several years ago to Pope John Paul II. He had all these nuns that got his mail. It's kind of like the elves at the North Pole, the same concept. And wrote a letter and got confirmation from the Vatican that John Paul the Great did, and I know still does, pray for the people we speak to. And all I ask in return is if you would please pray for my wife and I, our family, and our ministry, and the spiritual protection of that, and also for all the students we speak to. Every year it's about 100,000. And I ask your prayers not just for them and me, but it's for you. Because if you're gonna get married, you know I could speak to your future and her husband or wife one day, you never know what lifestyle they could be in. In fact, I know a girl 15 years old one night said, I'm gonna pray for my future husband. And she prayed and went to bed. Years later, they met and married. She said, honey, I prayed for you when I was 15. And he's like, oh, thanks. And she says, look, there is my diary. I prayed for you that night. He said, I used to have a journal back then. Let me see what I was doing. Finds his journal, dusts it off. He goes, that's the year I was in the war because he was a veteran. She said, what does it say that night? He said, honey, the night you prayed for me was the night the enemy troops came in our line. They slaughtered almost every man I was with and they spared me. So, oh, thanks for your prayers. Prayers are good. Prayers are good. And I ask your prayers. And I know today I said a lot to you about future husband and wife. Some of you are being called to a higher vocation. Some of you girls are being called to religious life, to be a bride of Christ. Don't be afraid of that, especially if you're looking for the perfect man. Trust me, you can find him in the convent. Uh, guys, some of you are being called to the priesthood. Do not be afraid to give yourself completely to him who has already given himself completely to you. I've said a lot today about boyfriend and girlfriend. And I know that most of you right now do not have a boyfriend, do not have a girlfriend, good. Good for you, don't be like me. I started dating when I was 11 years old. One girl back then actually broke up with me because I forgot I was dating her. I was like, oh, high maintenance, but you're under this pressure. You don't have a boyfriend, you don't have a girlfriend. It's ridiculous. You have so much time to find love. A 12 year old boy came up to me. Jason, I have a relationship problem, can you help me? I'm like, yeah, what's going on? He goes, here's the situation. He goes, I dated a girl for three years and it was really serious. And then I took a year off and now I like another girl she's friends with, so I don't know what to do. He's talking, I'm doing math in my head. Okay, this guy is 12 and he just took a year off of a three year serious relationship, which means the guy was eight years old in a serious relationship. But I'm thinking like, what are you guys even doing on dates together? Watching like Blue's Clues or something? Like, like what, what do you fight about? Well, I want Dora the Explorer, I want Diego. I mean. Dude, you got time to find love. Take the time. Last thing is this. I know uh, if I could say anything to you, this would probably just be it. That if after hearing my talk today, maybe your heart is heavy and you know you have some thinking to do, or if you ever fall in the future, all you need to know is one thing and that's how God looks at you for doing that stuff. And this is how he sees you. There's a dad a few years ago, dropped his son off at preschool in Armenia. And he said, I love you, I'll pick you up after school. Promise, come get you. Dad drove to work. Huge earthquake struck Armenia. The dad shoots the car back to the school. It's too late. The school's collapsed, faculty's dead. Dad shows up. He said, I know my son is in the corner of that school. Starts tearing off the rocks and the glass. He dug for an hour, five hours. His knuckles bleeding open. His back is cramped up. He dug for 10 hours. Like you guys, fathers one day, you dig for your kid forever. 30 hours. He said, all I was thinking, when I dug for my son, as the promise that I had always made to him. No matter what happens, you know that I'm always gonna be there for you. Eight, 38 hours later, shoves off some board, looks underneath it, and there's the face of his son. And his son looked up to his dad and said, Papa. And his son turned to 14 kids trapped alive with him, and he said, see, told you my daddy was coming to get me. I told you that he promised. This is the love of God. It doesn't matter where you're at. He is right here to welcome you home. You guys have been an awesome audience. Thank you very much, guys. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.